So, Phil, it's been, uh, what, 35 years now since the publication of the, uh, the original Diamond Divvig paper. And that's had a, a tremendous influence on, uh, on, the, on the banking industry, on, on financial regulation. Can you um, tell us what the essence of that model is? What, what is the key message of the model? The key message is that uh, uh, banks uh, tend to be fragile because of the services that they provide. And in particular, uh, people don't know uh, when they're going to want their money out. And giving people an option to uh, take their money out when they want it is providing liquidity. Uh, also tends to make the bank unstable because um, if, if people are worried about the uh, bank's ability to uh, give them their money back, then the... Uh, banks tend to be unstable because because if everybody does take their money out, then the bank will fail because they won't be able to cover all the withdrawals. So I guess um, the point is, so if we're putting our money into a bank, have a checking account with a bank, the bank may take that money and lend it to a firm that invests it. Uh, so in a sense, my, my money is liquid in the bank. I can get it out any time I want. But the, the bank may have lent that money and lent other people's money uh, and have that tied up an investment that can't be liquidated, an illiquid investment. And I guess if we, if we all take our money out at the same time, that's the problem, is that the, the, there'll be a, if there's a run on the bank, the bank will become unstable, yeah? Yeah, so the, one of the benefits that we get from the bank, and this is the benefit in the model, is that it uh, creates liquidity. It provides this maturity transformation. So the assets are usually illiquid, uh, longer-term assets, and the liabilities are short or liquid assets. So depositors can take the money out whenever they want to, but uh, bank loans tend to be illiquid. Now you were writing back in the, in the 1980s on this, um, and I guess there hadn't been a bank run in the United States since, uh, since the Great Depression, some you know, 50 years or so earlier. I mean, so what, what made you think about this topic at that time? Doug said, you know, I think there are a lot of opportunities for uh, modeling uh, things in banking uh, using game theory. And I responded, you know, I, that sounded like a multiple equilibrium problem. I I'm, assume there's a paper about that. And I don't think there was, and uh, that was a small part of our paper in the end. Mm -hmm. But I think if it had just been modeling bank runs as a rational uh, multiple equilibrium problem, I don't think it would have had uh, the kind of impact it has. I think what's more important about the paper is that we have a workhorse model of liquidity and explain why liquidity is important and why it is that uh, liquidity uh, tends to cause the bank to be unstable. Mm -hmm. So just about 50 years before your paper was published in, in what, 1933, Federal Deposit Insurance was created, right? I guess regulators thought that that really had uh, put an end to bank runs. And why, why, why doesn't that work? Deposit insurance is good. Complete deposit insurance is better. We don't have complete deposit insurance. When we wrote the paper, actually, this was, this was an issue with some of the people we talked to. Uh, when Doug presented the paper at Wharton, University of Pennsylvania, uh, there was somebody in the audience who said, bank runs, why are you interested in economic history? Mm -hmm. um, you know, there aren't any bank runs anymore. Why do we care? I don't think there's anything wrong in doing economic history. I think it's it's interesting to look at that. But I think that you also learn from looking at uh, past problems what you need to do to avoid problems in the future. In, in terms of the um, the recent financial crisis, um, you know, one role played in that in, in terms of liquidity is, uh, occurs to me was um, capital adequacy requirements. Does the diamond Dibbig model have anything to say about capital adequacy requirements? So what I would say that we learn about capital adequacy in the diamond Dibbig model isn't so much about the cyclical things that we're talking about. It's, it's more that uh, if you impose higher capital adequacy requirements, then you're limiting the amount of liquidity creation that the banks can do. Mm -hmm. And in Diamond and Dibvig, in order to have a stark example, 
uh, we assume that the bank's assets are, are riskless. Mm -hmm. And this is not a bug, it's a feature. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the thing is that banks are unstable even if the assets are completely riskless. Everybody understands that banks can fail if the assets are risky. And if the assets are risky, there's a problem that if the asset value goes down enough, the bank's going to fail. Mm -hmm. uh, what's interesting is that there's an intrinsic instability there even if the assets are, are riskless. And so in, in the crisis, of, uh, a lot of the problems had to do with banks that were taking on a lot of risk, mm -hmm. and the risk was not detected by the uh, uh, capital adequacy formulas. So if you say you have a certain reserve requirement when you uh, have mortgages in your asset portfolio, then um, having those uh, assets in the portfolio, you can fix the amount of assets you have, but you can make much riskier loans. Then you make the riskier loans, you still don't have to provide any more capital, but when you make the riskier loans, uh, you can maybe get a higher return, and also the probability of failure is bigger. Mm -hmm. So the capital adequacy requirements uh, have this problem. That's not in the Diamond Dibvig model, but it's kind of in the background of what we were thinking about when we were, when we were working on this. It was too big a crisis to have a single origin. Mm. There were a lot of things that happened that that uh, fed into that. I think insurance companies are are banks too. They're similar to banks. Mm -hmm. uh, if they deal with retail customers and have explicit and implicit guarantees by government, they should also be limited in what they should do. So if this sorts of limitations had been in place before the crisis, without anticipating the form of the crisis, it should have been possible to avoid it because the banks would not have been allowed to buy CDSs and AIG would not have been allowed to have a proprietary trading floor that sold uh, CDSs. So what are the, uh, the the key policy implications or policy recommendations that drop out of the Diamond Dibvig analysis? Bank runs are bad in the Diamond Dibvig model because they interrupt real production that's, that's, that's important. That can be avoided, and we, we, have, we talk about several different mechanisms in, in our paper. One mechanism is the deposit insurance, but I think deposit insurance is important for the stability of the banking system. Uh, another alternative to that, which I think is not very efficient, and we saw uh, during the Great Depression, is, is uh, suspension of convertibility of uh, of deposits into money, so-called bank holiday, where banks just close their doors and say, for three weeks you can't take your money out. And that stops the run, but it also stops people who actually need the money from getting it. So the cost of that, the social cost, is, is very high. And then uh, a third uh, possibility that we talked about is uh, lending by the central bank. Uh, and U.S. had be through the discount window at the Fed. In terms of the deposit insurance, I mean, you mentioned that full deposit insurance would be, you think that would be a good idea? I think full deposit is an insurance is, is uh, better. There's talk about incentives that are provided by the depositors. If you, if you have uh, this, that they have an incentive to monitor. Mm. The problem is if you have long-term deposits where the money's tied up for a long time, there's no incentive to monitor because you can't do anything. If you have short-term deposits, you have an incentive to monitor, but the result of your monitoring is that you take your money out just exactly at the time that's a problem for the uh, yeah. bank and the regulators. So it benefits the individual, but there are systemic consequences, is, is the point. I Either guess, yeah. systemic yeah. or at least, at least, I mean, whether it spreads to other banks or other institutions, it's going to be a problem for the regulators who close the bank. But if, um, but if your incentive to monitor is reduced by having full deposit insurance, who does the monitoring? Uh, regulating banks is hard, especially when they can do almost any kind of activity. And the regulators are always two or three steps behind mm. uh, the banks. And 
The reason for that isn't any problem with the regulators. It's just that if the bank has a new product or a new strategy, they go through a development phase and then they go through an implementation phase and only when it comes out do the regulators get to look at it. And then the regulators have to spend time reverse engineering it and trying to figure out what's the impact of the new product or the new strategy on, uh, you know, on the safety of the bank, on, on uh, the banking system as a whole. Uh, in the financial crisis, uh, uh, Lehman was allowed to fail and AIG wasn't allowed to fail. And the reason was, although they both had a systemic linkage, having a bunch of banks fail at the same time would have been a big problem for the regulators because mm. uh, they have the deposit insurance fund is going to be insufficient. Basically, the, the AIG uh, did proprietary trading of uh, credit default swaps, uh, which are, can be viewed as a kind of insurance against uh, credit risk if for a lender. And um, the, some banks like to buy that because then that they thought they were laying off their credit risk. They didn't know that AIG was selling these, these products but wasn't bothering to hedge them. Yeah. And so if, the, if they actually need the insurance, if, if the economy goes south, uh, they wouldn't actually pay off because AIG was not hedging the risk that they were taking. Mm -hmm. Now, I understand that you um, have, a, a, on some occasion, um, advocated the reinstatement of the Glass-Steagall Act, right? Well, what I, would like, what I would like to see is something that's a modern version of Glass-Steagall. And could you just briefly explain what Glass-Steagall is? So, Glass-Steagall uh, Glass is, is an act that had some uh, noble and some ignoble uh, origins. Uh, one of the reasons that Glass-Steagall was instituted, Glass-Steagall separated investment banking from commercial banking in the U.S. It says that if you're a bank that has deposits and makes loans, then there's the limit on the other business you can do. You can't do proprietary trading. Yeah. Uh, you can't do investment banking. You can't hold equity positions in real estate. So you have the prudent bankers, and they're going to have retail deposits that are protected by deposit insurance. They will have to undertake only a limited list of activities that the regulators have a good chance mm -hmm. of understanding. Now, that's what I like about Glass-Steagall is that if you're going to have retail deposits, I would like to limit the other activities that you have. The list of activities would not be the same as the list of activities under the original Glass-Steagall, but that's the feature that I like. And so the question is whether, the, whether you take uh, an investment bank like Lehman Brothers, is that something that you say, you know, this is important for the economy, but it's not the main thing? Is it unimportant? Is it is it less important for the economy, so that we can let it fail like any other firm, or do we want to regulate it tightly and say uh, it's really important? We can't let it fail. Do you think um, it's likely there'll be another financial crisis? Yes. And in the foreseeable future, in the next five ten years, I wouldn't be surprised. I don't think that they've. I don't think that they've settled it and gotten things to a point where it addresses the real problems yet. Phil, thank you very much. Thank you.